Hello! Today we're going to examine the different types of wands used for exercise in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, because the wand is essentially a type of a stick or staff, you might be tempted to assume that you can just pick up any old stick to do these exercises with. However, if you saw the video that we just posted, which was basically a short visual history of the wand exercise, uh, you'll know that there are lots of different types of exercises that were applied to these wands. And that's why you tend to see a lot of different types of wands and barbells. So in other words, these were fine instruments that were made to very specific weights and measurements because they were designed to be done with very specific exercises. And although you do find some overlap between these different exercises, generally you do find a lot of differences in how they were used. So these were designed and manufactured with very specific things in mind. You just necessarily couldn't pick up any old stick to do the exercises with, which is why today we're gonna to look at uh, several antiques and several replicas and see exactly how they were intended to be used in different ways. So to start, we're gonna look at the longest uh, wand I have in my collection, which was, is basically a barbell, would have also been called a barbell at the time. This is made by Spalding, there's a maker's mark on the center of it. So this is not gonna be used in the manner of a modern barbell, modern barbells being much heavier. Uh, this being made of wood and very light, it's gonna be used more to develop flexibility, elasticity, suppleness, and things like that. And also to work muscles that you really don't have an opportunity to work uh, in everyday life or with um, some of the other exercises, as we're gonna see. So if they're not used for strength building, for heavy lifting, then why the spherical ends? Well, this is something I really didn't understand until I got a hold of this antique specimen and started uh, actually doing some of the historical exercises with it. But they do add a little bit of torque and inertia to the barbell. So when you're turning the barbell, you're doing twisting motions with it, you're using a lot of kinetic motion, the spherical ends have the effect of slowing down the movement a little bit with it, uh, which works really well because, for instance, if you enter into a twisting movement, you're not suddenly going to just snap back like you would with a, with a light short wand. Uh, with these spherical ends, it's going to slow down the motion, it's going to push you a little bit deeper uh, into that twist. Uh, regarding the length of the wand or barbell, that's going to facilitate a lot of behind the back uh, movements and positions, which you could still do with outstretched arms, which you could not do with the shorter wands or barbells. However, because of the great length, you're also a little bit more limited in terms of the types of movements and positions that you can do. So the shorter wands are actually a bit more versatile in that sense. So moving on, we come to the shorter iron barbell. Uh, this happens to be a French antique specimen, around six pounds. We also have a, a seven pound uh, version, as you can see, imprinted right into the iron. These were direct ancestors of the modern barbell. So when you look at uh, some of the exercises of the period, you're gonna see some more recognizable things, such as you know, curls and presses and lifts. They, they did do those sort of exercises with this. So in that sense, it will be more familiar to the modern gym goer, and uh, they did use much heavier ones at the time as well. However, due to the relative lightness of these, as compared to a modern barbell, uh, you will see more kinetic swinging types of exercises, which we'll be demonstrating soon in a future video. So here's another iron barbell we're gonna take a look at. Um, this is, again, a six pound French iron barbell, and uh, when it arrived, it was covered in rust. The surface was totally destroyed. So my wife repainted it. The reason why I'm showing this is that this design is actually based on historic decorations of the period. If you look at a lot of the old images from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, you're going to see a lot of barbells are decorated with these candy cane stripes. That goes for um, barbells and wands, and also uh, smaller wands used by children called batonets. Sometimes they were decorated with cheesecloth or had ribbons wound around them and other sorts of decorations. And even though uh, this is an antique French barbell, my wife added some red, white, and blue and some stars to sort of give it uh, an American motif. Next we're going to look at the short wooden wand, which is probably the most common type of wand that was used during the period. Um, this is not an antique, it's a replica built to exact 
historical specifications, were, which were pretty specific uh, from exercise to exercise. This would be the lightest and hence the fastest and most maneuverable type of wand that we're showing today. Uh, so because of that, you could do a lot of agile actions and motions that you couldn't really do or rather would not be as advisable with some of the other types of wands that we're showing today. So for instance, with this wand, you might suddenly raise the wand to shoulder height, then flip it down to a lower position, then flip it right back up to shoulder height. Uh, I don't really have the space here to, to show right now, but you could also do a lot of sort of flipping and twirling actions with this wand. Sometimes it would actually leave one of your hands, uh, flip, spin, twirl around, and then you would catch it with your remaining hand again. Some of those actions, uh, you could break your fingers if you tried to do them with an iron or steel wand. A lot of the exercises with these short wands have a very militaristic energy and staccato-like tempo. And they did make wands of this size with other materials, uh, such as steel, uh, nickel, and silver. And here is one such wand, another replica that I had made. This is a steel wand plated with uh, nickel and chrome. And it's basically a happy medium between the wooden wand that we just showed and the, and the earlier iron wand. You basically use it very similarly to a wooden wand, but minus some of the more agile and faster actions, which might be a little dangerous with this. Um, so it is more limited in that sense, but on the other hand, uh, it does work your upper body a bit more, which is good. And also, you have this uh, structural strength now, so you find some exercises with this wand where you're actually using the wand to support the weight of your own body. So you lose the option to do some of the techniques of the wooden wand, but you then gain some options to do a few other things. Now, the last thing we're going to look at is this iron wand, which is another replica I had made to spec. Now, you do hear a lot about iron wand exercises during the period and about iron wands. So uh, I had this one made to uh, some exact specifications from, uh, from a treatise. And imagine my surprise when it came back significantly heavier than the specifications said it would be. So mo the vast majority of the descriptions of iron wands uh, place them between um, four to six pounds, occasionally seven pounds. And I might have heard maybe come across one reference to a 10 pound iron wand. But this came out to 11 pounds, which is really a lot heavier than the vast majority of historical uh, specifications. So I started wondering why. And in looking at this page from the Narragansett Machine Company, which is a company that was located in Rhode Island, USA, which produced wands during the period, uh, interestingly, they have sections for both steel and iron wands, but the measurements and weights are exactly the same. So it's my current theory that unless those iron wands were hollow, which seems extremely unlikely, um, a lot of the references to so-called iron wands were probably actually steel wands that may have been um, coated, had a, had a japanned uh, finish to give it an iron look. But who knows, uh, maybe someone will find an antique specimen at one point and the, the mystery of the weight of these iron wands will be discovered. Thankfully, I didn't have this one made in vain because there were exercises with something like this during the period. They just really weren't referred to as wands. Uh, it was called the iron bar exercise, especially during the early and mid 1800s. You do see a lot of things like this in France and America. So there were some interesting exercises done with this uh, weight of implement, uh, and we may do some of those in the future. So that covers the major categories of the different types of wands and barbells of the period. Uh, they weren't the only ones, of course. There were other more unusual and rarer types of things that were used. There were short wooden barbells. There were the smaller ones for children called batonets. There were electric wands, and there were all sorts of other things as well. But what I've shown you here today are the major types and categories that existed. In the coming weeks, I'll be posting a number of videos as part of this ongoing experiment, looking at how each of these was intended to be used. So if you'd like to be notified about those videos, please feel free to click the subscribe button below. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.